Fantastic, I'm ready. Oh, well, let's rock and roll then. All right, let's go ahead and get started then. Um, first off, I had no idea that there'd be this many people this early in the morning, so I'm really impressed by all of you. Give yourselves a round of applause. We got out of bed this morning. Um, before we start, I just want to ask a few questions, get a feel for the room. First off, uh, how many of you were here for last year's Dirty Red Team Tricks talk? Excellent. You can leave now, same slides. I'm just kidding. <laughs> because I wanted to fool you. No, actually, it's all 100% new material. So I'm glad you're here. And I think you're going to really take a lot out of this talk. If you haven't seen last year's Dirty Red Team Tricks talk, I encourage you to look it up because I've decided there's so much I would love to talk about. I had to really cut a lot out of this one, and nothing from last year's repeated. So that's good. Um, for those of you who weren't here last year, I'd just like to get a feel. Um, how many of you don't know what the Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition is? OK, so this whole room is familiar. Fantastic. Good, very good. OK, for my own sake then, how many of you are involved in it in some way? Your red team, blue team, green team, orange team, spectator? Wow, OK, great. Here's what we're going to do today. Uh, first off, this is a very tactical talk. We're going to talk a lot about hacking and kind of, well, dirty tricks. And what I'm going to do in this talk, I'm going to introduce CCDC, but I'm going to spend all of five seconds on it since everybody knows what it is. I'll just briefly touch on the technologies um, I developed, which are very heavily shaped by CCDC, because Armitage which was written originally for CCDC. And then we're going to go through, this is the only review part, uh, the evolution of how exer uh, our exercise red teams have been organizing themselves since 2008. And this is from my perspective only, but it's been kind of a cool evolution. And then we're going to go right into the tactical part of it. We're going to talk about command and control of your compromised host. We're going to talk about persistence. And we're going to talk about how our access strategies. And kind of an underlying theme you're going to see through all of this is automation and how it kind of fits into these different things. But there's going to be some cool tricks, too. So first off, for those watching on the internet, I suppose, because everybody here knows what this is, CCDC is a, a defense-only competition for college students. Okay. Uh, you can learn more about it, www.nationalccdc.org. There's 10 regions. Uh, the winning college team from each region goes on to a national competition to win uh, prizes and job offers from sponsors. Uh, the teams have the same hardware and software configuration across the board, which is great if you're writing scripts to hack into all of them. And they're scored on their abil availability, uh, excuse me, ability to keep services up their ability to respond to business injects, and everybody's favorite part, the ability to stop the red team. Um, just a ranty thing uh, for me, uh, there's a lot of talk, I think, in our communities and our conferences that everybody's like, wow, this is really, a, we're really attack focused as a community. That's stuff where the interest is. But a lot of people are like, what are we doing to actually develop next generation defenders and motivate them to get out there in the real world with skills they're going to use to defend networks because not everybody's going to become a pen tester, for example. Um, if you want to look at an organization that's really doing something towards that, look at CCDC. I've been involved with it since 2008 in the Northeast region. And I think one thing you'll take from this talk is this evolution that happened. And every year, the student teams force us as a red team to up our game big time. I would take the top teams in any of these regions against a team of very seasoned professionals um, put them on par or even above because these students are incredibly motivated. They're not complacent. They know that there's a threat out there and what they come up with and what they're able to do in a very short amount of time is nothing short of amazing to me. So if you're a competitor and you've played in this event, my hat's off to you. You guys are just awesome. Um, just <laughs> I, I call March and April red teaming season every year. This is kind of my CCDC resume. I do other exercises too though. Northeast since 08, Mid-Atlantic the past two years. I did pack rim via VPN. Uh, I was on the national CCDC red team, so I got that perspective. And um, Rocky Mountain for like three hours until the VPN died on me. But it was fun. I got a story from it, so that's kind of cool. 
Uh, real quick, why I'm giving this talk. Um, of course, you know, it's just fun stuff to talk about. Um, the other thing, I like giving away my kit each year and how I do things or what worked because it forces me to come up with new stuff. And so this is like a way of, it's like giving your friend $5 and saying, every time I go talk to somebody new, give me a dollar back or 20 bucks, whatever. I used to do that, actually. Um, that's why I'm, I like talking. I'm comfortable talking to people now. <laughs> I wasn't always. But um, it's like that. Giving away my tricks forces me just to keep learning. Because if I hold on to the same things and keep relying on them, I'm afraid I'll go stale. Um, and the other thing, too, is CCDC heavily drives the agenda of the work I do because it's a laboratory. I've got so many motivated network defenders, 100 of them practically per event, that it is a chance to actually just see how these different people respond to things and just get a sense of what works across the board. And what I found is for everything I've come up with, somebody's able to defeat it, but not everybody. So that's uh, a lot of fun. Uh, for those of you, I'm the developer of Armitage, and it's a red team collaboration tool. It's also a front end for the Metasplate framework. Again, I built it for CCDC, and so you're going to see it in some of the demos. And again, what Armitage is known for, just to kind of lend context to the things I'm showing you and talking about, is it allows me to have a central attack server, and my red team members can connect to it with a client, Armitage, and we can all work against a victim network or 10 victim networks at the same time. A very powerful thing, but it's a building block. Um, as a researcher, one of the ways I approach problems, I don't build technologies to give a solution. I build technologies to ask a question. So when I built Armitage, the question wasn't, or the solution wasn't, here's how red team should collaborate. It's, if we had these things, we could begin to collaborate. I don't know what that would look like. And that's what we're going to be talking about a little bit here, too. So that's kind of the heart of everything I do. But the big theme for this year is, uh, for me, is a technology called Cortana, which was funded by DARPA's Cyber Fast Track program. And I see several of my FITS friends here. Thank you guys for showing up. I appreciate it. Uh, they were my first audience several times throughout the past year. We'd have like four-hour sessions where I would like in painstaking detail demo things to them. I appreciate your patience, guys. Um, is it for me? No, it's fine. So what Cortana is, is Cortana is a scripting language. And through Cortana, I'm able to write bots that connect to this red team collaboration architecture. And it's also possible to write scripts that run from Armitage, or any of these bots can run inside of Armitage, too. And it actually has its own debugging tools. And the thing about Cortana, it was not, oh, look, at, let me build a language and make Armitage scriptable, although that was what I wanted. The research question behind it, which is part of the reason I was able to actually uh, pitch DARP on it, was we've kind of, to a degree, got some good insights into collaborating with humans, OK? What happens when we add automated actors to the mix? Where is the line between what a human can do and what a bot can do, OK? And this is, these are the questions I was exploring through the Cortana effort. And I hope in some of the stories I share with you today that you kind of get some of those insights and can take some of these ideas forward. So going back, uh, let's go back in time a little bit and just talk about um, the history of all this. Uh, 2008, 2009, here's what CCDC looked like. We had one guy with core impact getting into everything, OK? And I was really jealous because everybody was like crowding around this guy like he was a hero. And like we celebrated this guy. I did too, actually. And if anybody else wanted to get access to systems, they needed to whip out Core Impact if they had it, which he's the only one who did, and um, exploit the same vulnerability. We did some other cool things, but we were trying to figure out a way to work together besides just having one guy hack into everything. And one of the things we tried that I haven't talked about before was a failed effort during the competition called Funhouse. And what I was basically trying to get a core guy to do is said, hey, send me a Netcat listener, basically, and give me basically a socket connection for a shell, and I'm going to send a bunch of commands to that compromised system. We'll try to do stuff to it automatically for everything we get. And couldn't make it work during the competition. So Funhouse was a failed effort. But I called it Funhouse because I thought it'd be cool if we ever got access to put the student systems through a house of fun with all the goodies we could do to them, which actually drives the agenda of everything else you've kind of seen me do in this past several years. Um, 2009, a friend of mine, Ryan, who's another researcher who didn't have core impact, he, um, he was actually getting into systems kind of when everybody else had given up. 
Although we had a guy, Brandon Edwards, who was looking at his, for a zero day in one of the applications, the web applications folks were using, and he found one. That was pretty cool. But uh, Ryan <laughs> was getting into systems late in the game by just trying to log in with default credentials. And that inspired me to write some scripts that I ended, uh, ended up giving away last year um, to actually automatically log into all the systems right at the beginning um, with default credentials, very Unix heavy, and just backdoor the Unix system six ways to Sunday. And the situation we had there is we could gain a lot of access. Um, we could persist ourselves, but we had to like spread out the post exploitation with Netcat listeners, and that was kind of easy to see. Okay? And if somebody else wanted to get into a system and not actually be given access, they had to actually exploit the same vulnerability. So we had a lot of the same issues. And the Netcat thing only happened in like the last three hours on Saturday. But it inspired me to develop Armitage and to pursue that red team collaboration problem. And in 2011, the game looked like this. We would have access people getting into systems and using um, interpreter persistence to uh, put ourselves in the registry and call back to a shared Metasploit server. Post-exploitation team would be connected to it and just doing different things. Access people would be setting their pivots up off of that Metasploit server and getting into the networks that we already had a foothold on. And this model worked um, reasonably well, although at the time, and for the wrong reasons, I gained a distaste for the interpreter persistence because I thought it was too obvious creating a service and installing interpreter and registry keys. And later in this talk, you're going to see why I was completely wrong about that. 2012, the game changes again. Because students got really good at spotting Meterpreter in our active shell sessions, got really good at watching Wireshark, here's the situation we found ourselves in. We would have access teams um, basically breaking into stuff and passing sessions over to our loving, I call them shell Sherpas, because our job is to guide, protect, and shepherd all the shells. That's the role I usually play. Um, but the access team would be breaking into systems, passing those sessions off to me, and I, myself, uh, my friend Jerry, and uh, my friend Jeff, we would be managing different persistent strategies against these hosts, and we were doing a different kind of command and control. It was very synchronous, very callback every 15, 20 minutes, okay? So not an active connection. And what we would do is we had our own set of IP addresses, and whenever somebody on post-exploitation wanted to do something, we would actually pass that access off to the post-exploitation server to allow them to do something. Now, if that access, the active interpreter session got burned, we could just give them a new one, and that was our way of like kind of maintaining access. Okay, that was our strategy. And of course, same thing, access team using the shared Metasploit server to develop more access. Our job was just to make sure that we kept it. So I'd like to show you, before we go on the rest of it, it's just a little video, um, give you a flavor of some of the fun we have. This is from a really cool event at RIT called the uh, Information Security Talent Search, and we call it Team 12 TV. It helps to actually see it, though, or have it explained. We were in one of the students' systems. We had a projector up, and we had VNC watching the student's desktop, okay? They're administering their mail server at the time. And we decided to use a tool called Proxy Chains to tell that through a pivot um, that we'd set up in Metasploit, to make it look like all of our connections to their mail server that they were watching at the time was coming from them, okay? So this is kind of the situation. So here's just a little video. And keep in mind, this is up on a projector, 15 of us in the room just laughing. So here you can see me, proxy chains. Uh, you can kind of see it. I want you to watch. Right here, you're going to see everything I typed, but I'm typing it up here, okay? So, here I am, telnetting in, and I'm like doing my SMTP protocol. Hello, you sexy thing. Letting them know, I gotta let them know what I think of them, right? It's kind of a cool team. And, you know, we're just basically got the ability to display something to them. They see it. Okay, cool, cool. You guys see it. And we're coming from their IP address, though. So we're them. So they have no idea what's going on. They don't even think we've compromised them. So I'm like, hey, dude. Um, we own you. <laughs> and he has no idea, like, because we're just telling to his server, he probably just thinks we're just messing with him, right? Like, we're just this mean red team who can't get in. And so we just kind of keep going back and forth. And um, one of the things we're doing at the same time is we're logging all his keystrokes. 
And he's trying to go in and actually put a block on, and we're kind of like making fun of him, saying, dude, don't block yourself. That's not cool. <laughs> um, but the best part is he's going, and he's about to do some little bit of a system administration, and we love it when you type in your password. Do it. It's okay with me. Type it. Yes, I love that. So now we decide to, oh, I don't know. We decide to share that password back with him. <laughs> and there's 15 of us and just one kid working on this desktop, like just trying to do his little job. And there's like 15 of us just putting his password right there in front of him while we're watching. So this is the kind of fun we get to have on the red team. It was a little bit, I don't, I don't think it was quite mean-spirited, but that was like right the limit of just kind of like messing with somebody a little bit. <laughs> so let's go ahead and jump right into the tactical portion of this and let's start out with command and control. I mentioned this year, one of the things that's much different is instead of relying on an active remote administration tool like Meterpreter or just even a shell session, we moved to a synchronous command and control across the board, okay? There are several of us who are like carnies during March and April. We travel event to event, push the button, and give the students a ride. And <laughs> we developed um, some tools. I developed something called Raven, which is a, um, a synchronous agent for Windows to call back low and slow and let us task it to give us new sessions. My friend Jeff developed something called Mayhem for Linux. And my friend Jerry developed a root kit very similar to Raven, but it's kernel level, uh, called the G-Spot. Uh, aptly named for uh, reasons he can share with you. I have the utmost respect for my peers. That's why I'm wearing a blazer. And, you know, so I won't elude, uh, go further on that. So here's how Raven works. One, it's very simple. Once it starts, it goes to sleep. It's like, ah, oh, I'm running. Let me go to sleep. And occasionally, about every 15 minutes, I make an HTTP request back to one of several embedded URLs. And if there's nothing there, it goes back to sleep. No problem. But if a file exists, it assumes that file is shellcode. Just raw, unfiltered, genuine draft shellcode. And it'll create a thread and inject that, inject that shellcode into the thread and just let it go. Okay? So in that way, we're able to just task it to give us a new session. Hey, I want a interpreter session. Here's the stage for it. Go. Um, something about Raven, this is also, I developed a piece of software, commercial side called Cobalt Strike. This is the only thing you'll hear me say about it. You can come to my table. I'm giving away free pen test labs too. I'm way back there. Um, but I, this is, Raven was a precursor to Cobalt Strike's be, uh, beacon feature, which is basically um, a synchronous command and control. It's a payload. It can talk over DNS, talk over HTTP. And unlike Raven, it's got a nice GUI and it can be delivered with Metasploit Frameworks exploits. So a little bit more on that, um, but something else too, Raven, I'm releasing that today. So I'm giving you guys source code so you can tinker with it and try to make your own evil asynchronous command and control as well. So no problem. <laughs> on a personal note, I love doing open source, so I keep trying to find the balance between um, making like really cool things, but also to keep like just putting what I'm learning because I benefit from what you guys contribute and giving something back. So I'm working on that. So I hope you guys do enjoy Raven. Um, but one problem with Raven is fine, we can get it onto a system, but how do we hide it? And that's something I'd like to talk about next, persistence, OK? First off, here's something I was ignorant about. The old Windows, <laughs> the interpreter persistence stuff, installing um, a registry key, um, setting up a service, with an asynchronous callback, it works really well. I did not know that. I didn't suspect that. I was looking for something more esoteric because I thought students were finding us in the registry and kicking us out that way. Um, now I'm pretty convinced they were just looking for our command and control and blocking that, and they weren't actually digging us out. Okay, so students, my, point, my um, bit of advice to you, even if you're not seeing traffic, figure out where these registry keys are, figure out how to look at them, and Look for us there because we're there even if you don't see us, okay? That's very important. That's very important in uh, real life as well. And that's something I took away this year is a lot of our callbacks survive straight through the end of most competitions, and that was um, very rare, okay? Uh, that's kind of unheard of the past several years. And these methods right here worked. The next one I'm going to show you is a little bit more esoteric, has its limitations, 
but it's something I don't think most people are looking for either. So I'd like to ask you guys, and you can see that clearly enough to answer the question, can anyone, just raise your hand, um, tell me what's wrong here? Um, could, could you repeat that, please? Why are the DLL files there? Okay, that's a good observation. Why are the DLL files there? It looks safe, right? The, what's the date on it? Uh, August 3rd, 2004? You sure that's a problem? I know I highlighted it. Actually, that's not the problem, but the DLL thing was what I was looking for. One of our persistent strategies um, was DLL hijacking on explore.exe. Here's what we did. Um, there's this URL here. When I release slides, you can actually get to it. Um, there was a piece of malware out there, and what it was doing is dropping a link info.dll file into C colon Windows. And explore.exe, when it loads its libraries, it searches all these different paths in a certain order and says, hey, I need to load link info.dll. That file is located in system 32, right? But explore.exe search for it, searches for it first in C colon Windows. So if I drop my malware, my persistent agent, into C colon Windows link info DLL, when the system reboots and the next time explore.exe loads that DLL, I've just been given access in memory of explore.exe. Okay? So this is one of the persistence tricks we used this year. It has its limitations though. First, the access I get, the explore.exe runs under the privileges of the user that's logged in. During these events though, the, the users are usually administrators and escalating on uh, Windows XP is not that hard either. Uh, the other thing too is it only loads when the user logs in and they start doing stuff. Until then, it's not going to do anything. But this was kind of like our last hang on for dear life into that system grip. And once I like, found this, I was very secretive, didn't want to tell anybody about it because I just thought it was such a fun trick. I know it's a very common thing, um, but I was hoping to like, you know, just pull the wool over the students' eyes, but this is one of the things we were doing. And let's go ahead and have a look at how we set that up and change timestamps uh, using the Cortana technology funded by DARPA. So here I am. I'm going to go ahead and open up my um, install Raven CNA file. CNA is Cortana scripts. And first thing I have to do is actually patch Raven and put my URLs into it. So I do all this nifty stuff right here, put my URLs I want to call back to. Usually I have multiple IPs in here. Um, I open up the DLL for uh, reading. I patch a 1024 buffer of A's with my URLs and um, basically rewrite it as link info.dll. I do the same thing to create an exe to install it with the other persistence mechanisms in Metasploit. And now what I do is when I get a session, I call a function called install Raven. And what this does is it makes sure that my session is got all its libraries it needs, so it loads standard API and priv. And I'm going to do a demo of this, so that's why I commented out this part, so I want you to see the uh, DLL hijacking. But I run the persistence module with Cortana, and I um, point it to my executable to install it in different ways, like lsas.exe, startup uh, is um, system registry key, startup as a service, uh, VMware tools D, and as a user, tray.exe. So if you see those floating around, that's me. <laughs> the next thing I do, I go to a system, C colon Windows, system 32. This is the really nice thing about Raven. It can do, or not Raven, uh, Cortana. It can do what a human can, interacting with a compromised host. So it can say, hey, I want to run Timestomp, which is an anti-forensics capability in the Metasploit framework, and I want the timestamp parameters on um, link info.dll. And once the output of that thing comes back, this handler here is called on interpreter timestamp, and I just parse through the values and store them. Next thing I do, that now I've got a timestamp for those things, because all these commands are actually queued and happen one at a time. Next thing I do, I go to C colon Windows and I upload my link info DLL file. I then wait till that happens and I just call a token command to trigger once I know the upload's finished. And 
When that happens, I go in and I actually call um, a Cortana function to create all the nice little parameters in, for the interpreter command to actually update the timestamp of this file. Last year, you saw me do the Unix equivalent of this with my little shell scripts. Well, Windows is a little bit harder to have that interaction with, but with Cortana, it's pretty easy. And we were actually able to do the same kind of anti-forensic uh, anti stuff we did on Unix in Windows. And also kind of hide ourselves better. Somebody's going to notice a DLL from 2012, but not necessarily 20, 2004, especially when it's the first 15 minutes in the competition. So that's kind of how we hit ourselves and how we installed this. By the way, this script is uh, up in my GitHub repository as of 4 a.m. last night, too. I take care of you guys. Oh, I was supposed to demo that. I'm sorry. I don't mean to cheat you of your demos, or of my demos. I like doing them. Here I am. I'm in Armitage right now, OK? One way you can interact with Cortana is just go to View, Script Console. And let me make that bigger so you can read it. Is that good? Want it bigger? <laughs> and what I'm going to do is I'm going to load a script till the, oh, it's till the DRT, oh, DRT. And I want install Raven CNA. That's too big. Let's go smaller. Okay. So I've loaded the install Raven script. Now when I get a session, it's going to install Raven for me because there's an event handler on session, sync, go do all this stuff. So let me go ahead and just launch the classic MS-867 against a victim system. Hit launch. And Armitage can do everything for us. Sending stage is always good. Let's go see Cortana's perspective. Oops. I just told uh, Raven to tell us exactly what it's doing. So it's listing all the commands it's doing. And it installed Raven on that session in about 2.7 seconds. OK, that system is now hooked with Raven. For you to appreciate what I did with the Cobalt Strike, let me show you how I had to task Raven and how I did it for two months. I had to go create a listener for interpreter. This is the Armitage way. Could do it in the console. It'd be a little bit slower for me. Um, some people type just so much faster than I ever could, though. So I'm just going to hold shift click, press launch to keep this open. Let me say I want this as raw shell code. And if I get this wrong, I'm going to crash Raven. So that was one of the scary things doing this. Generic none. I have to make this to thread. And all this is documented, by the way. I don't cheat you guys on that. Hit launch. Oh, yeah, launch. And I'm going to save this to a file that Raven will come download. Var www.a. I think. OK, good. Now let's go over to my web log. And let's watch the callbacks happen. <laughs> my tail is my beacon console. And let's make that there. That's good. Now let's go ahead and uh, reboot the system and go do some stuff. OK? And I know I changed the password earlier. I hope I remember it when it comes time to. So let's go ahead and reboot. Reboot, I say. Oh, there you go. Good. What's that? So what you're going to see is system's going to reboot. I'm going to log in. I'm going to hit the start menu. And you're going to see some stuff happen in uh, this thing down here. And you're going to see Raven call back. So let her go. That is the longest shutdown time ever, isn't it? There we go. I consider this, there's two demos I have. The other one's really fast. I will get to it. Because I'm going to talk really fast on everything else. So give it a second. This is my talk on the Windows Start screen. And, and, good. Oh, how nice. It logged me in. Oh, because I reverted. Didn't give it a password. That's fine. So I'm going to go ahead and hit. Um, Start, command, and what you see, you see that callback? And by the way, lightning bolts all through that nice DLL hijacking thing. So that's an example of Raven being used for persistence. Access strategies. Oh, 
Access strategies. First off, same old song and dance, my friends. MSO867 Net API um, against some unpatched Windows 2008 and Vista, MSO950 SMB negotiation, blah, 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 and PSExec with default credentials. For those of you who don't know what PSExec does, it basically logs into a system, uploads a file, and schedules it to run a second later. Um, this script, own.cna, is very simple. It's on my GitHub repository. It's basically the one command, exploit, this exploit, this IP address, go, in a loop. Let's go ahead and see what that looks like though. So I do have a very short video. So I want to show what this looks like at pack rim ccdc. If I hit play, I push a, our, we've got all these sessions, I type do it, and Cortana just goes to work and is actually just backdooring the living daylights out of all these systems at once. Probably about like uh, 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 over 100 sessions. I don't know a team of 10 red team people that can do it that fast. And I'm on IRCs thinking that it's kind of epic is what I'm saying there. So, you know, we had a good time with that. This is what a little bit of ownership looks like. Um, sometimes though this year it was a little bit hard. So what I want to say here is that don't give up. Uh, for example, Rocky Mountain CCDC, uh, new, or new region this year, and they made it really hard for the red team. They gave students kind of completely patched systems, firewalls were up right away, everything. So we started doing stupid stuff like posting to the forums that they had to host saying, this is a white cell inject, and then putting, I'm a dumb user, I need help, here's my problem, and gave them to a link to a URL slash myproblem.pdf. When they click it, they got a nice dose of browser autopone. <laughs> so it actually hooked two teams. Um, and that's the point. If you're ever on red team, don't give up. Try the stupidest thing you can think of. It can't hurt in this environment. Uh, Northeast CCDC. We had a similarly hard problem, okay? They, um, the students were given one Windows system that was patched, all Linux systems, and an hour head start changed their passwords. Uh, we ended up writing a script to um, tell us when we saw a new host. We we're basically importing our results into one central Armitage server displayed on a big screen. Had another Cortana script that was announcing changes, and you can see that up there. I see this host with this banner. And what was really cool about that is it actually announced new attack surfaces to us um, at a very critical time. We were actually able to attack um, Zimbra when they were setting that up with default credentials before they had a chance to secure it. And we were able to get like Apache Tomcat that well as, as well. And the takeaway from that is with bots, uh, the really powerful thing is that we have, um, the word I'm looking for, the bots are doing the tedious work for us and giving us opportunities we may not have had otherwise. Um, one of the things I want to talk about too that was really very critical to us this year is Windows Credential Editor. How many of you have not heard of WCE? Or oh, all of you have then? No? Oh, you, okay, so how many of you, if you, excuse me, how many of you have heard of it? I'll phrase that right. Okay, cool, about a third of you. For those of you who don't know, You've got to download this and try it out at home. This is a really cool tool. It's, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, but it's written by Hernan Ocha. Uh, it's similar to a tool called Mimi Cats that my friend Henry introduced me to. Shout out, Henry. And um, what it does is it does a trivial reversal of some stuff in Windows memory to actually pull back your plain text Windows credentials, your login credentials. Okay. We had an experience with that, didn't we? <laughs> I won't tell that story. <laughs> um, but you can find more about it at ampliosecurity.com. And one of the things we did this year that was really cool at most competitions is we had a bot running that would constantly loop through all of our sessions, run Windows Credential Editor, inject it directly into memory, and pull, pull, run it, parse out its output, add the credentials to the creds table, and make an announcement to the chat room saying, hey, check out these credentials for this host. What was really cool is at Pack Rim, a lot of us were working remotely, and we were chatting on IRC, we were over VPN, and somebody didn't even know that that was a bot doing it. And they're like, God, whoever's getting all these passwords, thank you, I'm just ps executing into everything. This is awesome. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, bots are cool. So, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna demo that for you real quick but something I just realized at the last minute. 
I reverted my VM, so I've got to actually give myself a password and log in and log out. So let's go ahead and do it real quick. Um, we'll make it um, Henry Rocks. <laughs> Fair enough. So we're going to go ahead and log off. James, you rock too. He came by for a DVD. See, I, and Georgia, and every, I got a lot of friends in this audience, so I'm just happy to see you guys here. Well, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. So let me just log in as Henry Rocks. Now, by the way, this demo may not work, and the one reason it may not is because it, I think logging in and logging out would be enough to put it where it needs to be, but I may, need, I may have needed to reboot, but we're going to find out. So what I'm going to do, let me show you the wce.cna script. And you can see Raven continued to phone home. Um, let's go over here and open the app, just show you what this looks like. I define a Cortana console command called WCE. Just give it a session to run against, and it'll run against it. And what this does is use the Cortana function to actually tell Meterpreter to execute this local executable in memory on the target host. And so we give it the WCE binary. And when that comes back, we parse through all of its output. And we basically announce to yourself, here's the host, here's the information. Um, say announces to the chat room for the bot. And I parse out the username password from the output. And I just run creds-a to go ahead and add that right to the creds table in Metasploit so everybody can use it for whatever. So very nice little thing. And that's the cool thing about Cortana is you can actually just integrate different stuff. So let's go ahead and uh, exploit this host again. This took its tasking away. It's good. So um, let's go ahead and do that. I like getting sessions. Good. And let's go ahead and load wce.cna. Um, da, 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 da. Okay, it's DR, oh, yeah, DRT, oops, and WCE.CNA. Okay, and as usual, we'll just tell it to uh, tell us what it's doing. And let's do this WCE session one. Here's all the stuff you'd have to remember to type if you wanted to do what I'm doing right now. And give it a minute to come back. And like I said, if it doesn't, it's probably because I just needed a reboot to actually trigger the. Um, the whole thing, but it does take a few seconds, so. Well, let that be a lesson. Never revert your VM right before your talk. <laughs> That's fine. What would happen, by the way, is it would just print out the uh, uh, password. And actually, if you'll humor me, what I'll do is I'll just reboot the box and, yeah, let's tell it to run one more time. I'm up for that. I'm going to reboot the system and I'm going to go on, and if we have time, I'll come back to it because it's a really cool demo to see. But we know it works. <laughs> had a little uh, situation where we had to recover a password. <laughs> so um, yeah, <laughs> let's see here. So kind of um, to just tie this up a little bit, as I've kind of gone through some of this, um, one of the questions I had this year during uh, CCDC was, how can automation help us? First off. The obvious things were things we've been doing before, um, launching the opening salvo, actually getting into the systems, getting the low-hanging fruit. That worked out really well. Um, installing backdoors. Those are all things I expected to be able to do with Cortana. And if it couldn't do those, I would have been really sad, and I would have asked DARPA to defund me. Um, what was really interesting, though, that came out of this, that was really neat, is the bots giving us the window of opportunity. I didn't expect that, honestly. It all happened very organically. Uh, it started out with my friend Jolly saying, is there a way, all these people scanning stuff, if we could just know what's changed? And I'm like, yeah, I can give you a script. And then somebody else saying, I'm running Nmap every minute and changing my IP address. I'm busy. I'm not importing it. Can you automate that? I'm like, don't you want to help us out? It's like, um, sure. Can you automate it? I'm like, yeah, sure. And we end up with a system where we had these bots running from different hosts kind of working with each other to inform us so we could just take advantage of those time-limited opportunities. And that was really cool. And it was also just neat to see the automated post-exploitation feeding the actions of other Red Team members. So right now, I think this is a very conservative view of what we can do, can do and should do with automation because these actions we took were pretty safe, minus the opening salvo. Um, but it was pretty cool to see the humans tasked and basically tapped to go do something um, by a bot. 
So in this talk, what we did is we talked about the collegiate cyber defense competition. I talked about my technology toolkit with Armitage, Cortana, and the collaboration, and how that's evolved. I've talked about how we've evolved as a red team because the students keep getting better, and I hope we keep getting better as well. And we talked about how our command and control strategy changed this year to one of a synchronous command and control, not a lot of active rats. Uh, we talked about our persistence strategy, where last year very Unix heavy, this year we went to um, very Windows heavy. And we talked about our access strategy, which hasn't changed much other than the ability to pull out your plain text creds from memory. Why is that important? Don't reuse passwords at all. It is extremely harmful to your defensive cause during CCDC and probably in real life too. So that's something to uh, take away from all of it. And of course, uh, the, things, the things I am releasing today the code I mentioned for Raven is on GitHub. If you go to fasteneasyhacking.com and go to the manual and look up all the stuff on Cortana, the Cortana this GitHub repository is linked there. Uh, the Windows Credential uh, Editor script is on GitHub as well. Uh, the Differ script is already there. Uh, the auto-own stuff is already there. Um, where to go from here? First off, you can find me on Twitter, Armitage Hacker. You can learn more about Armitage at fasteneasyhacking.com. Codes on GitHub, please contribute. I really welcome that. And getting some really evil stuff, like a guy, Int128, I guess he plays at Midwest CCDC. He's got the stuff to change like your keyboard layout to Dvorak. He's mean. I'm not that mean, OK? So I, next year is probably going to be really scary. And please, um, I'm not, it's funny, because I mean, I'm just a volunteer and not that tightly connected with the organization. But I'm a really big fan of CCDC. I'm a big fan of the mission behind it. Not just the mission, the results. Because that is an organization that I think is getting results um, to making us a safer, uh, safer nation and even a safer world, because I want that for everybody. So you can learn more about national, uh, CCDC at www.nationalccdc.org. And before I turn over to questions, would you guys like me to try the WCE demo one more time? OK. Let's do it. Did it come back is question. Oh, OK, cool. Good. All right. Um, what was the password? Henry rocks? Right. <laughs> he knows it. Um, OK, let's go ahead and exploit the system. So it's funny. I did test this in my hotel room um, this morning, and it worked beautifully. So I want to see it work. My friend's like, why do you always do live demos? I'm like, I, I just, I can't do it any other way, so. Well, now it would be just funny if the VM didn't want to actually trigger, so. Um, let's, um, t -t 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 -t. we're going to do this the old-fashioned way. There we go. I'm just going to launch a browser exploit this thing and um, escalate my privileges, and MS867 doesn't want to go for me. Doesn't hurt my feelings, just how it is. Oh, Box is just like saying, what are you doing to me? I think my VM is like frozen. Oh, there we go, kind of. You know what I'm going to do? Since this thing is not responding at all for me, I'm going to uh, do this. I'm going to take one question, so I've got time for. And if you want to talk to me, I'm going to be way in the back by the Capture the Flag room. Please do come by. I've got those pen test labs on DVD. So with that, um, who wants to give me the one public good question? Feel free to just be like, whatever. Anybody? Where do I get my clothes from? Do you, now, is that like because you like it? I go to a boutique in DC called uh, Lost Boys. And the woman who sells it to me, her name's Kelly. And she's, she calls this the money jacket. She's like, you put it on and make it rain. So I love this jacket. So Lost Boys in DC, I love it. So with that, guys, I'll be back over by my booth. Thanks you, thank you again.